welcome Mr. Henry Doss. I'll use some of his briefing, what he mentioned about his, himself. Once upon a time, uh, retired former banker, oftentimes rock guitarist, composer, sort of data geek, serial attempter at a multiple adventures, master meeting, conversation facilitator, won some, lost some, been there, done that, community leader, volunteer, idea generator, Mr. Henry Doss. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. Welcome, everybody. Um, let me start, if I may, just by saying what a privilege it is to be here. Um, I get the pro pardon. Oh, there we go. Can you can you hear uh, Henry? No. No. I tell you what, I will move. Zika, how's that? That's better, thank you. Okay, I'll sit right here and this will work just fine. Okay, thanks. Okay, no, thank you. I do want to, I appreciate very much the chance to be here in this community and the chance to talk today and hopefully add some value to the business community. And I do get the prize for coming the longest to get here because I went about 11,400 miles for this meeting. And it's a long commute. Um, I'm really excited to be in Palestine. I'm really excited to be meeting business people, meeting people who are involved in entrepreneurial activities and learning and growing and, <clears throat> and participating and making sure the Palestine, Palestinian economy is prosperous in the future. And I, I appreciate you all allowing me this chance to do this. Um, I'm very grateful. I was asked to talk about uh, sort of micro trends in banking. And I wrote down the title, Micro Trends in Banking. And it sounded to me like about the most boring possible thing that anybody could say. And I thought if I saw a seminar called Macro Trends in Banking, I wouldn't go to it. <laughs> I would go somewhere else. So I thought, let's, let's at least try to make this a conversation about what are the opportunities in the general financial services area that entrepreneurs might want to investigate and look for. So if you're okay, I'm gonna kinda just sort of take you all through a short conversation about, from my perspective, what I think some of the opportunities might be. There are others, different kinds, of course, but these are just some, some that I would look at. Uh, and I would also ask, I would really like to be interrupted, challenged, questioned. If I say something that you want more of or you disagree with, jump right, except for Scott, feel free to jump right in and do that so we can make this kind of a dialogue because it may come as a surprise or not that I don't have all the answers and I don't know everything. So with that, we'll just start talking if I can run this. I'm trying. Got it. The first thing that comes to mind is, of course, you know, th this is the boring part, so just bear with me. At least think through what the macro banking environment might look like for the next five or 10 years, macro being global or large regional areas, global trends in banking, and so on. So it, this is kind of common knowledge. There's no real insight in here. But if you look around and you think about finance and banking over the next decade or so, more or less, equities in most of the markets are probably going to be okay. There won't be any stellar times. won't be any really bad. There may be a few dips, but no bad times. So you're going to get reasonable performance in equities over the next decade or so. At least in the United States and in Europe, and I'm not sure about the dynamics of other, other places, but you're going to see recessions more frequent. The historical norm for recessions going back to the turn of the century was one about every three and a half years. Since the late 60s, they've been running about every eight years, and most people are thinking that recessions are gonna recur a little more frequently, going heading more toward the, uh, the norm, which means, of course, that you'll have more frequent recessions, and there's a point to that. It doesn't take a genius to know that healthcare and energy and IT will drive economic performance in the next decade. Another thing is that I think the dollar becomes less the standard currency of the world. It'll probably still be the dominant currency of the world, but it won't be the standard in the sense that, uh, go ahead, in the sense that it has been in the past. And that has some implications too if you're talking about exporting and outsourcing. 
technical problem. It's okay. okay. Interest rates are going to rise. We all know that. Uh, we're going to start being worried more about inflation than deflation. This is different from region to region, but on a kind of a macro basis. Another thing that I think occurs in the, in the global economy is protectionism, and that's going to be driven by a lot of social cultural issues and a lot of other things. But one of the challenges for entrepreneurs who are thinking about outsourcing is that I think there's going to be a global trend for people to near source or in source uh, in some instances. And that's so just something to keep uh, on, on your mind. The majority of the world growth, we all know this, is going to come from emerging markets. The United States is not going to drive world growth. Emerging markets are going to drive world growth. China is going to continue to do what China does. And as we all know, economists will continue to predict only the obvious and they'll miss the actual and they'll predict nine of the next six recessions. <laughs> Pay attention. Nine of the next six recessions. <laughs> that means economists will pick nine recessions, predict nine, and only six will show up. That's an old banker joke. You're supposed to laugh. It makes me feel bad if you don't. <laughs> I didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> hold on, hold on. You're doing training. There we go. <laughs> okay. So what? So what? The world has an economy. Banking does things. So what? If you think about it, the banking industry is the second large, largest market in the world, second only to government. It's huge. And, the, and, you know, I'm an ex-banker, in case that stupid introduction I wrote didn't get it. I was in banking most of my adult life. Banking is open to innovation, but frequently bankers are kind of opaque. They, they don't get innovation on the first and sometimes the second take, or the third sometimes. So the banking industry probably more than anywhere needs innovation, but they're really kind of slow you know, to, to take up on innovation. And you just need to keep that in mind as you're thinking about innovation and banking. So I want to offer a few potential strategic implications for the entrepreneur that you might be able to pull out of the macro view. Now, there are literally hundreds of different ways you can look at the macro banking information. Hundreds of different ways. I picked one because I like it. But you could pick any other if you wanted to. But let's think about a few very quickly. You could hypothesize that the financial services consumer, that is the person who's using financial services products, is gonna be looking for some things. More than ever, the consumer of, of banking services and financial services is gonna be looking for information. They're no longer looking for checks or loans. They're looking for information. Information about investing, information about how to manage their, uh, their money. Sometimes information as simple as, what do I have? What is it worth? What might it be worth? What's my credit score? Things like that. So it's anything that will support decision making and planning, consumers want to have that. Consumers are getting increasingly competitive in, across the board in most markets, but particularly in banking, people are beginning to understand that what you charge me for check, book, checking account, I can get somewhere else. If you're going to charge me something here for a loan, I can get it cheaper somewhere else. And if you're only going to, going to give me this, I can get more somewhere else. So consumers of those products are going to be looking for features, pricing, novelty. The other thing is... Screensaver for you. Sorry? I'll disable the screensaver. Oh, okay. The other thing is... If, you, if any of y'all were around 25 years ago, there was a movement called mass customization where everything was going to be personalized. Well, that is starting to become a reality now. And when people consume financial services products, they don't want a checking account. They want my banking relationship. Everything must, must, must be personalized. Okay? And... I'm going to go a little bit quicker, so I'm going to get to something. Control, consumers want to be able to control the security of their accounts, access account, customization, everything else. They want it to be my way, which is <laughs> technical. Thank you. Go back up one. They want it to be my way, my when, my how. Every banking customer is going to be looking for that to be a banking experience that is mine or to my terms. There is no 
achievable access for consumers because it has to be instant. A consumer of banking and financial services products will not wait a minute. They want to be able to access everything right now, this minute, and take action. And the other part that's a little fuzzy, but you need to think about this, is that in the banking and financial services, everything's going to be linked. The banking services, the payment system, social media, the blur between your personal and your professional life and your banking experience is going to be blurred even more. So somewhere in that banking and financial services, there's a customer experience being looked for that is more than banking. So information, competitive products, personalized control, doing it my way, ease of access, and everything linked is what I think the consumer is going to be looking for. So if that's the case, the financial services companies are going to be looking for different things. Number one, which is not strategically right, but is important. Number one, what all banking companies are going to be looking for is cost control. Particularly, they're going to be looking at that from the perspective of ROI. If I'm going to spend a dollar, the way that I do an IR evaluation or an ROI evaluation of that is going to be much more stringent and much more, uh, much more have much more hurdles to cost. I want ROI, if, you, if I'm going to do something, I want to see the profitability. Gone are the days when anybody's going to do CapEx or any kind of spending without really rigorous views. So cost control is a technology opportunity, by the way. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. All banks are going to be concerned about fixed cost. Fixed costs kill business, whether it's a big bank or a little bank. A fixed cost is, kills businesses. So they're going to be looking for outsourcing, near sourcing, ways to take everything they do out of their income statement and put it somewhere else. And banks, is, I know this sounds obvious, banks are going to be looking for profitability. But this is a clue. This is important. I'm going to stand up for a second because I've been sitting in plane. This is a clue. Mm -hmm. Banks are going to be looking for profitability in a lot of ways. They'll jiggle the books. They'll do treasury management. They'll do all kinds of things. But the thing that is going to be attractive to banking is to find profitability through performing relationships. So what does that mean? That means that instead of having your checking account and your checking account, I'm going to have your checking account, your mortgage, your car loan, your car insurance, your brokerage, and you the same thing over here. Because the more a bank can aggregate relationships, I did a study once years ago and it holds up. The profitability dynamic in an individual consumer relationship, same holds true for business relationships, is not linear. It's logarithmic. So adding one relationship, one incremental product or service to a relationship, doesn't double it, quadruples it, the, because it absorbs incremental fixed costs as you layer things on. I'm talking banky stuff here. But banks are worried about profitability by virtue of performing relationships. They're going to be looking for efficiency. They're going to be looking for marketing edges, always looking through insight, data, targeting, differentiation. And if ever banks looked for a really good rationalization for cost in tech, this is it. You can't walk in and say, I got a G. Willy Wonker thing to sell. It does this gizmo stuff and expect people to buy it. They're going to look for ROI. And then the last most boring but potentially lucrative place is to look for technology and automation support in the compliance and regulatory areas, particularly in Western and, and in European and American banks I know better. Automated ways to fulfill compliance. Does this all sound reasonable? 